Here I am again, your reliable menopause teacher here at Menopause University. Class is in session. <laughs> so let's not procrastinate. Let me orient you to where we are. You know I present everything in very precise order, in units. And each video builds on the last. So this particular video is video number 292. And it's part of a big unit on the three big diseases of estrogen deficiency, which are heart attack, osteoporosis, and Alzheimer's disease. Now I've already given you a separate unit on each of those diseases individually, but now we're addressing all three of them together. And so far in this particular unit, Videos 281 to 285 entail the comparisons between the three. Videos 286 to 291 have addressed estrogen replacement and the estrogen window for all three. And today we're going to talk about the time frames for development of these three big diseases. This will help you understand why it's so important to bridge the gap by starting estrogen replacement early in your postmenopause, as well as why the estrogen window designates starting estrogen replacement in the first five to ten years of your postmenopause. And it will explain why procrastinating on starting estrogen replacement may be something to avoid, if at all possible. Now, while all of this is in my book, it's included in the individual chapters on these diseases, whether you have the first edition or the second edition. Neither book has this particular perspective of all three diseases together, so be sure you stay here and watch. I think the best way to approach this is to look at the time frames for each of these diseases individually first, and then look at them as a group. That way you'll understand the time factors for different aspects of diseases that are due to estrogen deficiency. And as we go along, we'll create a graph to depict our findings. And let's address them in the very same order that I presented them in the individual units, starting with heart attack. Now, while a heart attack is the result of estrogen deficiency, it doesn't happen suddenly. Instead, it's a progression of events that ultimately lead to a heart attack. And all these individual events are due to estrogen deficiency. What happens is your lipids start changing. Now, if you don't know what a lipid is, you'll need to go back to the unit on heart attack, which encompassed videos 160 to 185. There were 26 in all. In that unit, you learn that you have a lot of different lipids, some good and some bad. Well, wouldn't you know, at postmenopause, the bad ones increase and the good ones decrease. So, in the absence of estrogen, your total cholesterol increases, your lousy LDL increases, and your triglycerides increase, while your healthy HDL decreases. Many women notice this just by having their routine cholesterol studies drawn annually at their root routine well woman appointments. And regardless of their diet and lifestyle, this decrease in good lipids and increase in bad lipids occurs when they stop producing estrogen. In consultation after consultation with women who have not yet gotten this education, They'll provide me with three years of lipid profiles showing worsening of all values. And they wonder why that's happening when they've done nothing to cause it. The good news is that you can discover this trend early with simple blood tests and you can do something about it. And of course, you can get more invasive testing if you want more information about plaque buildup in your arteries. And that's what I discussed in the very last video. So, what do these changing laboratory values imply? Well, they are closely correlated with the buildup of plaque in your arteries that goes from this, which is completely clear, no buildup, to this, which is just a tiny bit right here, to this, which is 40% oh, occluded, to this, which is really, really blocked. And it is the buildup of plaque 
that eventually occludes the artery to cause a heart attack. But these changes occur at different rates in different women. And as you learn in the heart attack unit, even the symptoms of a heart attack in a woman are very different from those in a man. As a result, even when it would have been possible to diagnose a heart attack early, both women and professionals commonly miss the diagnosis. And for that reason, heart attacks are very deadly for women. So the time frame for development of a heart attack is intimately connected to the time frame of estrogen loss. It's not at all uncommon for a woman to have a heart attack in the very first couple of years without estrogen. You see, estrogen only prevents a heart attack while your body is producing it. And as soon as it disappears, your risk starts increasing exponentially. So this is why the estrogen window designates starting estrogen replacement in the very early years of postmenopause. So let's graph this early development of plaque buildup that leads to a heart attack. Here you see a simple graph. Along the horizontal x-axis, I've listed ages from 40 to 90. And the blue line represents the increase in risk and incidence of heart attack over time. Notice that before age 50, which is the average age of postmenopause, heart attacks are pretty much non-existent. But look at what happens between the ages of 50 and 60. That's when heart attacks spike. In those first years of estrogen deficiency, that's when it's so critical for increasing your risk for a heart attack. And it's all because estrogen is what prevented them before you lost it. And the risk does continue to increase with age, but at no time is the risk as sharp as it is when you first lose your estrogen. So this is why you have to start taking estrogen replacement in those early years if you want its benefit of preventing a heart attack. Now how about osteoporosis? How do you think the timeline looks for it? Well, as I've taught you, estrogen loss causes bone loss. It's an absolute direct automatic occurrence. There's no middleman and no leeway. So you go from this and you start losing 2% of your bone each year in those first five years without estrogen replacement. And then you continue to lose bone at at least 1% every year after that until you're left with this. But you've also learned that there are no symptoms whatsoever of bone loss. The first indication is a fracture of your spine from something as minor as coughing or sneezing, or a fracture of your hip from something as basic as standing still or sitting. The only way you'll know you're losing bone other than sustaining a fracture is to get a bone density test. And that would be adequate if all women got them when they first lost their estrogen at postmenopause and then regularly thereafter, but the guidelines dictate waiting until you're 65 for your very first one. And by then, you will have lost at least 25% of your bone. So you can't afford to postpone starting estrogen replacement if you want to prevent bone loss. Here's how osteoporosis looks if we plot it all by itself on our time frame chart. This time, the orange line represents the increase in osteoporosis over time. And once again, notice that before age 50, which is the average age of postmenopause, osteoporosis is pretty much non-existent. But look at what happens between the ages of 50 and 60. That's when you lose more than 15% of your bone, which is why those first years of estrogen deficiency increase your risk of osteoporosis so severely. And it's all because estrogen is what prevented bone loss before you lost it. The risk does continue to increase with age, but at no time is the increase as sharp as it is when you first lose your estrogen. So this is why you have to start taking estrogen replacement in those early years if you want its benefit of preventing osteoporosis. 
Do I sound like a broken record? <laughs> I should. It's the same story as heart attacks. Procrastination on starting estrogen replacement has a negative effect on both. And now let's put both heart attack and osteoporosis on the same graph so that you can see how they compare. You see here that the risk of osteoporosis is even greater than the risk of heart attack in those first few years of postmenopause. Now we get to Alzheimer's. I've taught you that the mental fog, brain fog symptom of fuzzy thinking is not just a temporary inconvenience. It is your brain's way of telling you that its estrogen receptors are empty. Estrogen was its fuel and it simply cannot function without it. So if you extrapolate that early symptom of being less than clear-headed over the next 40 years, the result is brain shrinkage. Well, guess what? That is precisely what Alzheimer's is. So little by little, your brain shrinks, but you don't have a single sign until your brain is 40% gone. And by then it's too late because it just keeps on shrinking. And Alzheimer's is irreversible, untreatable, and 100% fatal. Unfortunately, there's no way for you to detect it early. We have no blood test, we have no screening test, and we have no clinically available imaging test. So your best bet is to protect your brain to prevent Alzheimer's in the first place. And estrogen replacement is one of the most critical things for doing that. Procrastination on protection of your brain is deadly. So here's what Alzheimer's looks like all by itself on our graph. With Alzheimer's, the risk increases steadily with age. There isn't a sudden increase early in your postmenopause. Ah, but that is the deceiving part. Why? Because it has to start at some time, and there's no way to know when that time is. And once it starts, it just progresses from there. So despite the fact that you don't see fully developed Alzheimer's early, you have to understand that it does begin to develop early. And if your goal is to prevent it, you have to start taking estrogen replacement early in your postmenopause in order to do so. Don't procrastinate. So if you plot all three diseases on the same graph, here's what you get. And that early time in postmenopause between the ages of 50 and 60 is when all three of these diseases start laying their foundations for the big fatal events later on. I'm sorry I sound so fatalistic, but I would much rather sound fatalistic than to have you be a victim of their fatalistic tendencies. So the lesson here is that the time frames for development of heart attack osteoporosis and Alzheimer's as a result of estrogen deficiency are very early and that's why you have to start taking estrogen replacement early if you wish to use it to prevent them. The whole idea is to bridge the gap between your own body's estrogen and estrogen replacement. I guess you could say that time frames are just deadlines in disguise. But what if you are a procrastinator? What if you just don't get around to starting HRT until 5, 10, 15, or 20 years after becoming postmenopausal? Or what if you unintentionally procrastinate simply because you didn't get this education in time to avoid doing so? What then? What's the effect of starting estrogen replacement late? Well, if you procrastinate, the consequences are different for each of these three diseases. For heart attack, a late start of estrogen can cause a heart attack if your heart has aged so much that it can't handle estrogen anymore. This is why you hear studies showing that HRT can cause a heart attack. The HRT didn't cause the plaque buildup. That was already there as a result of the procrastination.
And although your heart arteries used to just love estrogen, all that procrastinating enabled a bunch of plaque buildup such that your poor heart arteries just can't handle what they used to love. When you think about it, there are many aspects of aging that behave along these lines. You used to be able to pull all-nighters and function just fine the next day. You used to be able to eat like a pig and maintain your figure like a twig. You used to be able to travel internationally and be unbothered by jet lag. I could go on and on, but no more. As your body ages, it cannot handle what it used to. As your heart arteries age, they cannot handle what they used to, even though estrogen was something that was good for them and that they loved. For osteoporosis, a late start of estrogen will stop your blood bone loss where it is so that you don't lose any more bone, but it will not replace the bone that you've already lost. So procrastination on starting estrogen replacement has no negative impact at all on your bones, regardless of how long you procrastinate. When you start estrogen replacement, your bones will welcome it and you will stop losing bone. That's not the same thing, though, as replacing lost bone, mind you. You'll just stop losing bone and you, your bone density will plateau where it is. So procrastination has a worse effect on your heart than it does on your bones. For Alzheimer's, a late start of estrogen replacement may slow the shrinkage of your brain in the future, but it will have no impact on what's already happened and it will not prevent development of Alzheimer's symptoms. So procrastinating on estrogen replacement will enable your brain to start shrinking. And there's nothing to guarantee that a late start of estrogen will prevent the disease process of Alzheimer's to ensue. Just think of your obvious symptom of brain fog as an indicator of your brain's desire for estrogen. Whatever brain tissue you lose is gone forever. You cannot replace it. So don't procrastinate on your brain. So this is why getting this menopause education is so critical. It's also why it's critical to get it early. So don't procrastinate. My dream is for all women to get this education in their 20s and 30s. You see, this gives a whole new meaning to the quote, time's a wasting doesn't it? In this case, time isn't the only thing that's a wasting. Your heart, brain, and bones are, wa are wasting too. This is also why tailoring of all the information to you specifically is so important. And it's what I do in consultations. So if you want me to do that for you, just go to menopausetailor.me to schedule. It's like taking a shortcut. You will get all the information and know exactly how to manage your menopause your way. So this is where I'll stop today. Next week, I'm going to address the limitations of estrogen replacement for preventing the three big diseases. And I think you're going to find it very interesting. So follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Subscribe and come back in a week. Bye.